As we continue our Advent sermon series on John the Baptist this morning, please turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 3. If you happen to grab one of those guest Bibles, you can find uh, where we'll be on page 823. The, uh, the opening verses of this chapter, um, as I read them, and perhaps as, as we will together here in a moment, seem to indicate that something in the, the course of Luke's gospel important is about to happen. If you take the gospel as a whole and you start all the way back in chapter 1 and you, you sort of read it in its entirety, um, it, it, it feels to me like the first couple of chapters of Luke are, are sort of like an extended introduction. But here in chapter 3, it's as if Luke is ready to get down to business. So we're going to get down to business with Luke. Um, the way that he, he words this and the way that he, he frames what's coming, it almost has a, a ceremonial feel to it. There's something... He wants to grab our attention. He wants to, 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 for us to focus in on what's about to take place. And we're going to do that here this morning together, beginning in chapter 3 with verse 1. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. And by the way, the word ruler there could also, it's more literally tetrarch, which we'll talk about here in a moment. His brother Philip was ruler over Iteria and Trachonitis. Lysanias was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation sent from God. Now, the gospel writer Luke is known for his details, but it's interesting to me as I look at this, this passage here, at, at the, the details that Luke includes, but then also the details that Luke leaves out. Look at the first verse and a half there again. We have the arrival of John's preaching set in reference to a whole bunch of other people. You have a Roman emperor, you have a regional governor, you have three tetrarchs, and, and don't, don't be confused by that. Tetrarch does mean fourths, a ruler over a, a kingdom that has been divided into fourths. That would be the kingdom of Herod the Great. When he, when he died in, in 4 AD, his kingdom was divided in fourths, but it was overseen by three people. That's why one of the tetrarchs oversees two, uh, half of the, of the fourths there. Uh, so we have three tetrarchs listed there. You even have two high priests there in Jerusalem. And so what, what sets Luke apart from the other gospel writers here is that uh, where Matthew, Mark, and John introduced Jesus in the context of, of sort of the messianic expectation of the Jewish people, Luke introduces the arrival of John in the context of world history. As Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when the right time came, or more literally in the fullness of time, God sent his son. There's this sense that, that as God has been overseeing all of human history, as God has been providentially guiding human affairs to his intended end, there's this sense that at this point in time, this is the time when God acts. It's, it's right here at this time. God is sort of like Gandalf the wizard. You remember from the Lord of the Rings. He, he's not early and he's not late, but arrives precisely when he means to. And that's God. God's not early and God isn't late. He, he arrives on the scene exactly according to his plan and in exactly the way that he intends to. Luke tells us when that is. Luke, Luke says, hey, as you look back over history and, and you survey sort of all of the events and all of the people and all of the times, you can say with certainty that God came into the world here. It happened right here. In space and time, God acted it wasn't that in, in this general time that some sort of theory began to emerge, some sort of collective sense of what is true or, or, or what is real. It wasn't sort of a, a set of principles that emerged among, among the human scene. It wasn't a theological framework that arrived. No, God himself appeared. He spoke and he stepped into history in action to save. 
But here's the thing. The date alone is not the driving force behind these particular details that Luke includes. If, if all Luke was after here is just giving us the exact date, well then, you know, the, the reference to the 15th year of Tiberius' rule would have sufficed. It's not just the date alone that Luke is concerned with. No, his details signify something deeper. And that is the gospel is making a genuine appearance, yes, in the world, but also to the world. The church father named Origen that you may have heard of before, he recognized that the names of the Roman and the Jewish uh, leaders here signify the universality of the gospel. This is not just a, a peculiar thing happening to a very niche group in the world, a very little sort of corner of, 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 of you know, the, the globe. You know, it's, it's applicable to just this small group of people in this little moment in time. No, the, the fact that, that Luke mentions sort of this, this pantheon of, of leaders in, in the world, not just local, but, but pertaining to the entire empire in which these people lived. No, it signifies that the gospel is not just breaking in during the reigns of these leaders, but also must be proclaimed to them. And indeed, in time, we'll see that a personal judgment about Jesus and the gospel will be required of virtually every single name mentioned here. And if those people aren't still around at, at that time, well, then at least the, the, the positions that they represent from the, the, the mayor, as it were, all the way to the empire. Every single level of human hierarchy and order and structure and leadership will have to, will have to respond to the message of Jesus and the gospel. And Luke gives us a glimpse of that right here in this introduction. Luke sees the arrival of John at this time signifying God's word fully entering the public domain, which means it has direct relevance and direct application to all people. John's message is a message for everyone, and that includes, by the way, you and me. You and I must make a personal judgment and decision concerning Jesus and the gospel in our lives. But what about the details that, that uh, Luke leaves out here? You know, Luke, Luke is the details guy. And, and, and yes, his introduction of John, it's, it's longer than the other Gospels are. And yet, at the same time, it omits certain key aspects that the others together provide. For example, Luke doesn't include the title, the Baptist or the baptizer. You can find that in Matthew and Mark. John has this, this particular title that has been ascribed to him. Luke leaves it out. There's no mention of the prophet Elijah in this passage. We hear about the prophet Isaiah, but nothing about Elijah here. We don't know anything about John's primitive diet or dress. He was a funky dude and lived in a really unique sort of way. I love in, um, uh, in The Chosen, he's called Crazy John. And that's John, to his counterparts, his peers, would have seemed like a crazy person, the way he lived. Um, and that's not mentioned here in Luke's gospel. Luke does mention later on that John was arrested, but he says nothing about his martyrdom. And so it's intriguing to me that, that Luke, as the detailed guy, you think he would include everything. You think he would, as he did his very comprehensive study and, and interview process, and he wanted to make sure he had everything down, everything listed, everything accurate. And it's not suggesting that those things aren't accurate, but what it does suggest that Luke is presenting John with a particular focus in mind. John has, has pr or I'm sorry, Luke has pruned this figure in such a way that it forces us to focus on his primary function as the forerunner, the one who precedes the Messiah. As we heard last week from his, his father Zechariah's prophecy about the coming of his son, you will prepare the way for the Lord, son. You will tell people, that's the key, you will tell people how to find salvation. And so it doesn't matter between the introduction section here in chapters 1 and 2 and the events that we talked about last week at, you know, pertaining to the, the conception and the birth of John. It doesn't matter how much time passed between then and right here at the beginning of chapter 3, whether it's 29 years, 30 years, whatever the exact amount of time is, it doesn't matter. Because in Luke's gospel, what matters is that the, the focus of the story is one and the same, and that is God speaking to man. God is speaking. They're, they're coming out of a, a season in, in the history of the world where God has been silent. There had been no prophetic voice for 400 years. 
And the people waited, and there was all sorts of messianic expectation leading up to this time. Go, go back and read the history of, 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 of that region of the world and during the intertestamental period between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, and you'll see it wasn't a time, a time of inactivity. There's all sorts of things happening on the world scale. There's all sorts of things happening in, 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 among the people of God, and there's this very strong sense of, of messianic expectation that God was about to speak, that God was about to act, that he was going to work. And that's part of the whole fullness of time thing I referenced earlier from Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. There's a sense that, that God was, was massaging the, the, the direction of the world, the course of the world, for this moment in time. But the people had been waiting. And God had been silent, and now he speaks. And that's the focal point of Luke here. What does God about to say, well, it's, it's all about the gospel. A divine message of salvation that comes from heaven to earth. It's a report. It is an announcement proclaimed, not of what man must do, but of what God is doing and what God has done. It's his message, not ours. The gospel is not a list of good ideas. The, the gospel does not mean good suggestions. No, the gospel means good news. Good news about what God has done through, th through his angels and through his prophets that have pr proclaimed these things, but ultimately through his son, the one who is the message in the flesh. You, I, I, I like to, to even go as far as to say Jesus is the gospel. He is the very word of God made flesh, the very self-expression of the Father, the, the Father's, the sum total of the Father's message, the, the goal and the end result and the fulfillment of every prophetic word up to this point, points to him. He is the word, capital W, in the flesh. And the word of God is preceded by a word from God, spoken through a man of all places, in the wilderness. And don't you think for a second that that detail is accidental or insignificant to the rest of the story. That John came, that, got, that John received a word and came from the wilderness. We know from the Old Testament that there's all sorts of deep meaning and significance to, to the wilderness. Yes, you probably recall that the wilderness was. Uh, as Israel remembered it to be, a place of testing and judgment. You can go back to Numbers 14 and read about the whole generation of, 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 of Hebrew people who were miraculously delivered and saved from bondage in Egypt, who then went into the wilderness and rebelled against God. They did not believe the reports. They did not trust in God's goodness. They did not trust in God's character or his power to save. They rebelled against him, and as a result, a whole generation perished right there in the wilderness. And so, yes, the wilderness was remembered as a, a place of testing and judgment. But listen, God is the one who led them into the wilderness to begin with. He delivered them from bondage, from slavery, and brought them to a place where then he gave them his word. It is a place not just of testing, not just a place of judgment. It is a place of intimacy with Yahweh. The, the, don't, don't forget what happened on Mount Sinai. God spoke to man. God made covenant with man. God brought a people who didn't have a God into relationship with him. I will be their God and they will be my people. It is a beautiful place of intimacy. And yes, Barbary, in the end, God ultimately delivered them out of the wilderness. He didn't bring them there to, to leave them. He brought them there that he might bring them out. He kept his promise and he provided. And there's so many things that God can demonstrate to man, not just in the abstract, but to people, you and me, in the wilderness. There's things about God. I want to go as far as to say, in a, in a broken world such as this, there are, there are certain aspects to, to who God is and what he can do and what his will is for your life that you cannot learn apart from the wilderness. In that sense, the wilderness is not just a bad place. The wilderness can become, oh, a blessed place beautiful place. In fact, by Jesus' day, the wilderness to Israel was associated primarily with prophetic hope. It was a place of hope. Imagine that, finding hope in the wilderness. Well, by that time, they, they knew about a guy named Elijah. And where did God provide for Elijah in powerful ways? In the wilderness. The, the sort of 
premier prophet from, from Israel's history was a man of the wilderness. Hosea would prophesy and say, hey, God would speak through the prophet Hosea, Hosea and say, um, a time is coming where I will bring Israel back to the wilderness. I will lead Israel once again into the desert and I will speak tenderly to her there. <laughs> now you're probably sitting there thinking, man, Pastor Sean, it sure is hard to hear tenderness in the voice of John. And you're, you're right, it is hard. It is a challenge on the surface at least to detect tenderness in the voice of John. But those with hearts, hear me now, those with hearts who are truly longing for God, those who have hearts that are at least a little bit open to God and his word, those who long for him to speak, those who desire intimacy with the God who created them, well, for them, in the voice of John, in the words of John, you can discern the wooing call of the lover of your soul. If you hear it, if you have ears to hear, you can hear it in the voice of John. That's because the God who visits the wilderness is the God who comes to the place of deepest human need. I hope you hear that this morning, friends, because I know a lot of you are in a place of deep human need. You're broken. You're suffering. You're struggling. You've been hurt. You've been harmed. You have all sorts of things just pressing in upon you. And some of you came in here, you thought you couldn't even get yourself out of bed and even make it here this morning. Yet somehow you managed to muster up enough will and enough strength and maybe the Holy Spirit gave you a little nudge and you found yourself here this morning and you need to hear that, that the God who visits the wilderness is the one who comes to the place of deepest human need. Look again at verse three and I'll prove it to you. Verse three says, after this sort of statement about the, the word of God arriving in the public domain that is relevant and applicable to all people. It says in verse three, then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River. Do you know what's interesting about that phrase? Well, in the, in the Greek, it is the exact same phrase describing the territory chosen by Lot all the way back in Genesis chapter 13 and Genesis 19 in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. That was, the, that was the, the Bible of Jesus and his disciples. They read the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And in Genesis 13 and in Genesis 19, as, as the, the Greek translation described the territory that Lot chose for his family, it is the exact same phrase that Luke borrows to use right here in verse 3 describing where John began his ministry to prepare the way for the Lord. And why is that significant, Pastor Sean? Well, I'll tell you why. Because within that territory lay a couple of places you might have heard of once upon a time. And those are the places with the names Sodom and Gomorrah. Those two places that are the very symbols of sinful humanity doing detestable things. If there's ever a, 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 a caricature of the brokenness of humanity of the rebellion of sinful man, of the darkness that lies at the, the root of the human heart, it is there. And yet that's the very place where God's word enters fully into the public domain. That sends a chill down my spine in a good way. <laughs> that's the place where John's preparation for the coming of God begins. This is where he goes to tell people how to find salvation. Yes, by calling people to repentance for sin, for saying the hard things, painfully cutting deep beneath the surface. John, I'm struggling to hear the tender voice of Yahweh in your preaching. I get it. But John didn't come to tell people what they wanted to hear. John came to tell people what they needed to hear in order that he could rightly prepare for the good news of God's grace through his son. We need to hear the bad news about us before we can rightly hear the good news about him. We have to. There's tenderness in the loving voice of a father who is correcting his children that they might live and be saved. And God fires the arrow of the gospel right into the bullseye of human brokenness. He goes right to the heart. It starts right there in that place of darkness. 
As Jesus would later make clear, his mission did not, was not to come and find the good people and round them all up and, and form a collection of, of followers that would make him look good. No, that was not the mission of the Son of Man at all, was it? It was to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. That's why his, the word about him begins at the darkest place in the world. The good news is, for you and for me, is that Jesus still wants to come to our place of wilderness. Where we have been rebellious. Where we have been wicked. Where you and I have wandered from God. Where you and I have questioned God or shaken our fist in the face of God. Don't think for a second that God only wants to come to you once you've gotten it all sorted out. If I can just stop doing that thing, if I can just start you know, being this type of person, if I can just pick myself up by the bootstraps and, and get it all together and quit being a, an idiot and finally you know, do something that would make God happy, then God will come and speak. Then God will come and show up in my life and do great things and he will bless me and he will be there for me. If that is your view of the gospel, you don't have the gospel. That is not the gospel. He doesn't come to the ones who have it all together. He doesn't come to save those who have saved themselves. He comes to the lost. He comes to the rebellious. He comes to the wicked. He comes to those who, even as he comes to them, are shaking their fists in his face. When we have chosen darkness over light, that's when he comes. When we have chosen the things detestable over the things that are holy. When we have said yes to the world and to the flesh and to the devil and resisted his spirit, God's grace comes even there. So have hope, friends. No matter how wayward you have been in your life, no matter how much you have resisted God, perhaps you've been the type that you've been skeptical your whole life, you've you struggled with the fact that everyone around you believes this nonsense and you just can't bring yourself to, to take that final step and believe it just doesn't make sense to you, and yet deep down inside you know something is wrong with the world, something is wrong with yourself, and you don't know the way out, and you've never even for a second imagined that Jesus could be the answer until this morning, Jesus comes to you, and he wants to show himself to you. Thank you for that story. Jesus showing himself to people that had no idea that he was showing himself to them. We have an old word in the the Wesleyan Methodist heritage called prevenient grace. And it's a word that has almost become so unpopular and so old-fashioned that no one even says it anymore. But I love the word because it describes a grace that comes before, a grace that precedes our awareness of it. There's not a single person in the history of the world who woke up one day and just decided of their own volition, you know what, I'm going to believe in God today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow Jesus. No, you only came to that place because there was one who pursued your heart long before you knew he was there. One who loved you before you ever dreamed of loving him. One who had you as the object of his affections. You were the apple of his eye, even when you were spitting in his face. Grace that goes before, that precedes you in your faith, in your trust in him. God's grace comes even to those like us. And friends, that's the best news that there is. It's not good news. That is great news. (laughs) A couple of years ago, J.D. Walt, by the way, I mention his name from time to time. If you don't know who he is, he's the, the chief editor of the uh, seedbed group of Asbury University, sort of pu- publishing uh, group there. And, and so if you subscribe to his daily text, he sends out a, a little devotional every morning. If you sign up, you can sign, give him your email address, and they'll send you one every, every day of pretty much of the year. And uh, it's, it's, I know several of you have benefited from that. I know Nino especially has really benefited from that, and it's, it's nourished your, your faith and helped you along. So I, I like J.D., and I like a lot of things he has to say, and sometimes he has a, a turn of phrase that really catches my attention. And he said something a couple of years ago that, uh, that really formed the basis of, of the inspiration behind this entire sermon series. And he said this. He said, The Word of God doesn't come to the halls of power in imperial Rome or to the appointed sovereign leaders of the provinces. It doesn't even come to the duly appointed religious authorities of the high priests who rule over the temple of God. All those people that we just named there at the beginning of the the chapter. The word of God didn't come to them. The word of God comes, we are told, 
in the wilderness. Don't miss this. The word of God came not to the halls of power, nor to the religious establishment, but to an obscure, eccentric outlier of a prophet named John. The word lands on the stage of history in the middle of nowhere. The word of God appears among the powerful and the prestigious, but it doesn't appear to them. They reside in in places of importance, Rome and Sepphoris, which is the, the capital of Galilee where Herod's house was. Jerusalem, these places of of prestige and honor and renown. And they have titles like emperor and governor and tetrarch and priest, high priest. John has no title (laughs) and his place of origin has no name. All of which says this. Not only that God is no respecter of persons, And by that we mean he doesn't distinguish among people like people distinguish among people. People who divide themselves and categorize themselves and classify themselves according to color and and income and where you live and what your accent is like. And by the way, I'm from the Midwest, so I have no accent. And you can just deal with that. I have no accent. You do, you southern people. (laughs) We love to divide ourselves according to those superficial surface kinds of things, don't we? And we have whole, whole structures of power in the government that love to pit people against each other because they're different. God is no respecter of persons. But something else screams to me out of this, this passage here besides that. Not only is God no respecter of persons, but his work to redeem and to save undercuts all the value systems and power structures of the world. It's as if God intends to crush the status quo. His invasion into the world is to undermine the world, to undercut the world, to crush the status quo of the world that he might establish his kingdom on the earth. But it's not through political revolution. It is through a spiritual revolution, one heart at a time. And that begins, by the way, with what John begins to say when he uses the word repent. Repent, which means literally to change your mind. Change your mind. You've been operating according to to the world, to yourself. You've been following the streams of the world, which, which, by the way, is human society organized without reference to God. It is anti-God. It is hostile to God. It is in opposition to God. And you were born a slave to that, to the world, to the flesh, your sinful nature, and to the devil, the enemy of your souls. You've been going this way, And John's call is to stop and turn. To turn. To change your mind. And you want to see a spiritual revolution in your life? I call you to turn. To turn from sin and turn to Jesus. That's that's what this message is saying. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care what you've done. He doesn't care what you look like. He doesn't care how much money you make, what color your skin is, what language you speak, what country, what county, what city, what township, what hospital, what parent. He doesn't care about any of it because in the face of God, there, he doesn't make any distinction like that. Every single person has value. Every single person has, has intrinsic worth to God. He created you. He sent a son to die for you, and he loves you all. Absolutely, God has no respect for persons, and he has come in the form of his son, preceded by a wild man in the wilderness, to destroy the status quo, to flip the world upside down, that you might experience a revolution in your heart, that you might go from death to life. And that's the choice that lies before every single person in this world. Will you choose death, or will you choose life? And you are already choosing death by virtue of your birth. And it takes a moment in time when God speaks through his word and you hear what it says and you're brought to a place because God's grace preceded it where you can finally say, you know what, enough of that. I'm going this way. I'm choosing him. I don't know exactly what it means. It's not all about understanding. Faith is not intellectual comprehension. Faith is trusting obedience. 
I can trust the one that I'm just getting to know because his word has cut to my heart. He's speaking to me now. He's wooing me back to himself. Even through the, the crusty, sort of borderline deranged voice of a wild man who, who dresses like, like a homeless person. I'm sure John had a funky smell to him. Who knows what kind of crazy things John looked like and represented and sounded like. And yet, it is the voice of God after 400 years of silence speaking to sinful man. Repent and believe. God still speaks today through his word. And it's not some secret truth reserved for the elite or the privileged. No, it still and remains forevermore the possession of the public domain. It is a word that has been proclaimed and is being proclaimed. Thank you for missionaries who are going to the hardest places in the world to proclaim what? Christ in his word. Yes, we accompany that with our testimony and we tell the stories of things that God has done, but it is the word of God that is going to the ends of the earth. God is still speaking through it today. And it always comes at just the right time. God has this knack for showing up when we needed him most. Isn't that what, what Paul says in Romans 5? When we were utterly helpless, God sent, sent his son to die. When we, at just the right time, when we're undergoing trial, when we're struggling, when we're lost in sin and darkness, hear the word of God speak even now into your own wilderness. Not a message of condemnation. That's never God's word. But a loving, urgent call for you to turn away from your sin and turn to him. Jesus, the light of the world, still comes to darkness. He still comes to our waywardness. He's still seeking to flip the world upside down in your life, and he demands a response from every single person that draws breath. So the question is, will you respond to him this morning? Because if you're here, and if you've been paying even 1% of attention to the, or any of the words I've said, he's speaking to you. Will you respond to him? Will you turn to him? Will you say yes to him? Will you say yes to the good news of God's saving grace that John prepared and that Jesus shared and even is? That's the offer to you this morning. And after we pray, you're gonna have the opportunity to respond by receiving the, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. Let us pray. Lord, thank you that you're still speaking through your word. Thank you that you have spoken this morning even through as imperfect and weak and frail and broken of a vessel as, as I am. You always superintend the faithful proclamation of your word, and I'm trusting, Holy Spirit, you've been speaking to hearts even now. Thank you that the word of God comes to the place of our deepest need. Thank you that salvation starts where we, are, where we need it most. Lord, come and, and bring salvation to someone here for the first time today, perhaps. Or, or just bring a, 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 re, a, a renewed sense of, of the work you've done in, in a person's life here today. Someone who, who, who chose to follow you but has been struggling or, or maybe they've wandered or maybe they've even turned their back. Lord, would they hear you calling them back today? For those of us who've, who, who have been walking faithfully and following you step by step, Lord, strengthen our, our, our determination to, to never turn away from you again. Lord, your grace is sufficient for it all. Your grace is sufficient to turn the most vile sinner from, from their sin to you, but your grace is also sufficient to keep us by your side. Your grace is sufficient to enable us to be more than just sinners saved by grace. Your grace is sufficient to make us holy as you are holy, to be like you every day in word, thought, and deed. And your grace is sufficient to keep us until the end. Lord, we want to persevere, and we can't do it on our own. We need your help. So come and, and give whatever is needed here as we turn to a time of, of the Lord's Supper. May this not just be some memorial of some past thing, but may it be a, an encounter, a very present encounter with the living Christ. Lord, come and have your way in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.